Monterey is one of the centers of um, important expertise on this, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Potter for inviting me and uh, Tina for all the help in setting this up. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm calling a paradigm shift. I apologize, I have a cold, so if you can't understand me, just shout and I'll repeat whatever it is that I'm saying. Um, this is uh, an extraordinary time, a uh, hopeful time, in the field of nuclear weapons. Um, we are in the midst of what I think is a paradigm shift from the old way of thinking about nuclear weapons. We're at that uncomfortable moment when the thinking hasn't quite evolved to the new paradigm and we're torn between an old way of thinking that clearly doesn't work and not quite knowing what the new um, way of thinking is going to be. I'm going to try and explain a little bit what I think the new way of thinking is. The paradigm, of course, is a worldview. It's a, uh, an interpretive framework that shapes really everything and the way we see everything. And um, it collects particulars into a whole. The most famous is Copernicus and Ptolemy. Ptolemy's view of the solar system uh, dominated for 1,500 years uh, with the Earth at the center and the Moon and the Sun and uh, the planets revolving around the Earth. And um, of course then Copernicus suggested that perhaps the Sun was at the center and this allowed them suddenly to build a model that resolved all of the contradictions and the anomalies that they had observed trying to make the data fit with the notion of the Earth at the center. So uh, I'm suggesting that we're going to have something like that with nuclear weapons, that we have an existing situation where there are all kinds of anomalies and we're going to come to see the world somewhat differently. Um, there's a really cute animation that goes with this that doesn't work. Uh, one of the things that happens with a paradigm is that the control of the, the overall worldview controls the way in which you interpret the particulars. So that if you look at this from this angle, it kind of looks like a fluffy duck with an odd-shaped bill. If you flip it on its side, it's a rabbit with long ears. And so it's actually, if you change your perspective, see this is actually much more fun than the animation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the original paradigm about nuclear weapons, I'm calling the apocalypse paradigm. It's uh, focused a lot on, it, it has in it a characteristic of biblical awe. Um, Oppenheimer says when he looks at the first test, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds, and um, all the people that wrote about it talked about it in a vision from the book of Revelations and so on. And, and this uh, Actually, the biblical name for the last battle at the end of days in the Valley of Armageddon is now the name of nuclear war. So we think of this in a very biblical way. Um, and because of that, morality questions are often uh, brought to the fore. And um, there's a lot of kind of end of the world apocalyptic discussion that goes on in connection with nuclear weapons. Um, and just to give you a sense for um, how this affects the individual interpretations, so that for instance, here we have a newspaper that says, peace, our bomb clinched it, Bernard Baruch says, nuclear weapons are the winning weapon, they're entirely, completely powerful. Jim, James Burns, who becomes Secretary of State under Truman, says that this great new weapon assures success in diplomacy. And then you get the hydrogen bomb, which scientists tell us is thousands of times bigger. And of course Oppenheimer says to some friends, supposedly war is no longer possible, and Einstein says nuclear weapons have changed everything except our way of thinking, and JFK says every man, woman, and child lives under a nucleus sword of Democles. <laughs> Um, but there are some contradictions and anomalies that occur as a result of um, this paradigm. 
uh, trying to see the world in terms of this paradigm. Right after World War II, even though the U.S. has a monopoly on nuclear weapons, the Soviets are not intimidated in the ne negotiations. James Burns comes back from Europe chastened by his efforts to use the bomb as a big stick. The Soviets eventually go ahead and uh, dominate Eastern Europe for a long time. Um, and in 1948, uh, even though the U.S. has a monopoly, they close off access to Berlin and uh, uh, touch off a crisis. And in 1948-49, uh, the Chinese Civil War goes on, and the bomb, even though it supposedly has this enormous influence, doesn't seem to have any influence on this conflict. Korea, the Korean War is fought roughly to a draw. The United States loses a war, even though it possesses the ultimate weapon. And the Soviet Union, as well, suffers their own humiliating defeat in Afghanistan, even though they possess nuclear weapons. Israel, um, despite the fact that nuclear weapons are supposed to prevent conventional attacks, in 1973, deterrence fails twice for Israel, once with Syria and once with Egypt. They both combined to attack during the Yom Kippur War. And in uh, 1982, um, the Argentines are not impressed with Great Britain's uh, nuclear weapons, and they invade the Falkland Islands anyway. So, um, this slide is actually considerably longer, but uh, if you check Wikipedia, which is not necessarily an authoritative source, but certainly a guide, they list 113 different instances of wars from 1945 to 1989 alone. So nuclear weapons don't seem to have made war unthinkable. They did not seem to provide significant diplomatic leverage. They didn't prevent defeat, and they didn't assure victory. They didn't prevent the loss of empire. Both England and the Soviet Union had empires, had nuclear weapons when they had empires, but they lost them. And they didn't prevent invasion in 73 and 82. So, so we have this biblical end of the world, apocalyptic vision, and yet the individual cases don't seem to necessarily line up with their contradictions. The way that people typically handle these anomalies is a phenomenon that I am calling nuclear exceptionalism. And it comes from the Einstein remark that nuclear weapons have changed everything but our way of thinking. Essentially, oh, here's Herman Kahn. Despite the fact that nuclear weapons have already been used twice, and the nuclear sword has been rattled many times, one can argue that for all practical purposes, nuclear war is still, and hopefully will remain, so far from our experience that it's difficult to reason from or illustrate arguments by analogies from history. Thus, many of our concepts and doctrines must be based on abstract and analytical considerations. So, essentially what is being urged with nuclear exceptionalism is that nuclear weapons are so powerful and so different that all the old rules don't apply. All the rules of human experience that normally shape events don't count for nuclear weapons. So these anomalies don't count because it's such a new and different phenomenon that you can't really expect it to conform to the past. And one really good example of this is the way people think about Japan and Hiroshima. In uh, the summer of 1945, beginning in March, the United States bombed 66 cities in Japan, quite severely. It's one of the most ferocious campaigns of city bombing in the history of war. And you might ask yourself, well, if blowing up a city, if burning down a city is going to cause the Japanese to surrender in August, why doesn't it cause them to surrender in March when Tokyo is bombed, or in June or July when countless other cities are bombed? And this, the response is the classic nuclear exceptionalist response, which is, oh well, nuclear weapons are different, they're special, the rules are different. Even though we, the outcome might be the same, we bombed these cities and they were destroyed just as much as these cities, it doesn't count because of the bomb being different. The other characteristic of exceptionalism is that it argues that nuclear weapons discussions are a history-free zone. You can't, as a nuclear analyst, make uh, points in life 
by urging that, for instance, we should study Waterloo in order to understand how a nuclear war would go, or that we can look at Jutland in order to understand nuclear conflict. Well, there are some problems with nuclear exceptionalism. And when you draw a trend line, ideally you would want a lot of data points to feed into that trend. The problem with nuclear exceptionalism is that you essentially have one data point. You're basing everything on one occurrence. There's another question, which is, if we believe in nuclear exceptionalism, if everything is different and so all the rules don't apply, you might ask yourself, well, why don't we believe, for instance, in jackhammer exceptionalism? Where you would say, well, now that we've invented jackhammers, everything that we know about drilling and mining and digging, we have to ignore. And now we have to rely on abstract and theoretical notions about drilling and digging and mining. So what would happen if we reevaluated nuclear weapons not from the perspective of, nuclear, of uh, the apocalypse paradigm, but from a new perspective? The first thing you would probably <coughs> want to do is to look at city destruction. City destruction is at the heart of what we think about nuclear weapons. There are lots of ways to use nuclear weapons, but the one that has the most emotional impact and that grabs people's imaginations most strongly is the destruction of cities. It turns out that cities have been destroyed in war for thousands of years, so that rather than there being no data about what it would mean to fight a nuclear <coughs> war, there's actually quite a large data set cities that have been destroyed. What's interesting if you examine this set of attempts to destroy cities and qualify it by saying that city destruction only counts if it, because there are lots of times when cities get damaged in war, but if you limit your study to city destructions that match Hiroshima, that is one third of the people killed two-thirds of the city destroyed. If you limit your sample in that way, there's a striking thing that happens. <laughs> what you find is that although there have been wars for thousands of years, there's 3,000 years of uh, human recorded history. And if you say, you know, 5,000, 10,000 wars in that time, the number of times that cities have been annihilated as completely as Hiroshima is only a handful, perhaps 20, maybe 18. And that's a remarkable thing, because if destroying cities is useful, if it gets you where you want to go, if it solves your problem of how to win a war, it would have been done again and again. You would do it to win wars, right? So how can it be that there's only a handful? Let's just look at some specific cases. Attila the Hun comes out of the Danube Valley in 451, fights a battle in at, in France at Chalon, loses, goes back, comes back the next year, goes to northern Italy. He surrounds Aquileia and destroys it. Aquileia is one of the premier cities of the ancient world, at the head of the Adriatic, and its people are killed and the city is leveled. What impact does that have on the campaign? It apparently has none. He goes on and, and uh, eventually attacks some other cities. He meets with Pope Leo. Pope Leo's either persuades him because of his goodness and grace or makes a large payment, we don't, we're not exactly sure which, and then Attila withdraws. But what's striking is that the city annihilation doesn't seem to have any effect. The Western Romans don't surrender as a result of Aquileia being destroyed, and Attila doesn't seem to get any long-term advantage from having done it. It's as if it doesn't count. Genghis Khan in 1220, 1219 comes out of the, uh, the steppes and attacks the Khwarazmian Empire. It's the western half of Iran, most of Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Tur Turkmenistan, parts of those. And um, he destroys more cities than in any other war until World War II. Uh, maybe as many as a dozen. He does it very thoroughly. Uh, some of the cities are so completely destroyed that you can draw a plow across them after they've been leveled. And people are killed in the most brutal way, so that they pile up heads of the slain victims in pyramids outside the city walls. 
And yet, do the Khwarazmians surrender? Does the war end as soon as the first city is destroyed? In fact, the war goes on for three years, and it doesn't end until the last army under the son of the Shah is defeated on the banks of the Indus in 1221. Once the army is defeated, the war is over. But until that time, cities resist, they fight, some surrender, some don't. But it's clear that this incredibly brutal campaign of city annihilation doesn't win the war. Tilly, uh, commander of some imperial forces in 1631, he attacks and destroys Magdeburg, probably 30,000 people. He burns the city, 30,000 people die. It's a Protestant stronghold. Uh, do the Protestants surrender? Are they dismayed? Does it win the war? In fact, they're encouraged to fight harder. They bring more forces onto the battlefield as a result. And um, the war goes on for 14 more years. In World War II, uh, the British don't surrender when London is bombed or when Coventry is flattened. And in fact, no member of parliament rises up to suggest that they surrender. Now that we're being bombed, we must surrender. Hitler initially is concerned that if German cities are bombed, it will affect morale. But in fact, the Germans sustain some of the most severe damage <laughs> and casualty rates of any, certainly from bombing, the, mo the worst. And they continue to fight on throughout the entire course of the war. The war doesn't end until the troops finally reach Berlin. Um, Soviets also suffer city bombing, and we're going to talk about Japan in a second. This is in keeping with the American experience. In the American Civil War, um, there were a number of generals in the Eastern Theater who said to Lincoln, don't you worry, sir, I'll capture Richmond any day now. Fighting Joe Hooker is particularly notable in this. He keeps saying, and, there was, and it, was, it was kind of the, uh, the center of a whole group of, there was even a popular song, On to Richmond. Once Richmond falls, the, wall, the war is over. Um, and it's interesting because Joe uh, Hooker sends this message to Lincoln, and Lincoln sadly writes back to him and says, no, no, it's Lee's army that is the goal of your campaign, not Richmond. And I can just imagine Hooker making rude comments to his staff about these rubes from the backwoods and interfering civilians. But in the, in the result, in the end, Lincoln was the wiser because even though Atlanta was captured and burned to the ground, and even though Richmond was captured, the South did not surrender until Lee's army was surrounded and forced to lay down its arms, and Johnston was forced to lay down his arms. So why doesn't city of destruction work? It's horrifying. People are killed. It's a big deal. People remember it. Why doesn't it win wars? The problem is that city destruction is has an economic component, and it does affect the, the, the prosecution of the war by denying resources. But primarily it's about killing civilians. And the problem with killing civilians is that empirically, based on the history that we know about warfare, wars are hardly ever won by killing civilians. Take a moment and think to yourself and name all of the wars that you know of that were won by killing civilians. In World War II, civilian casualties were quite high. Japan, 300,000. Germany, 570,000. But you might say, well, but, but war. In a nuclear war, civilian casualties would be much higher than that. That's not a significant test. You can't make that argument. But in fact, in the 30 years war, 20 to 30 percent of the civilians in Germany died as a result of the war, and yet, Obviously, the war went on for 30 years. The fighting continues until the armies are even more appalling. And for our purposes, to set the bar higher, there is a historical instance of civilian casualties being as high as almost 
1865 to 1870, in the Paraguayan War, uh, civilian casualties were so high there were 21,000 males of fighting age at the end of the war. The fighting goes on until the armies are defeated. So, the lesson of history is incontrovertible. Until August 5th, 1945, destroying cities doesn't win wars. So let's talk about Hiroshima. Um, it's difficult to talk about Hiroshima. There are lots of people with lots of feelings about it. Americans feel proud and guilty and all kinds of confused things mixed in together. And other people feel other things. Um, and should. Um, a lot of the last 40 years has been spent thinking about whether it was right or wrong for the U.S. to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki with nuclear weapons. I don't want to talk about that. It's an important question. I'm not interested. I want to talk about what I think is a more fundamental question. Not whether it was right or wrong, but whether it was effective. Did it win the war? Okay, we're just going to quickly recap. Um, remember the situation at the end of the war. Uh, Japan was largely defeated and they knew it. The fleet was confined to port. There was a submarine blockade. Food supplies are getting low. The economy is in a shambles. Cities are being bombed. They have considerable land forces in Japan and China, the Japanese. Um, but they are facing the prospect of a U.S. and British invasion. And importantly, the Soviet Union is neutral. They signed a neutrality pact in 41. It's set to run for five years. Okay. So the traditional interpretation is we bomb Hiroshima on the 6th. We bomb Nagasaki on the 9th, and on the 10th, the Japanese signal their intention to surrender. So let's look at this in context from the point of view of the effectiveness of the whole history of city destruction. If you could chart the effectiveness of destroying cities, and I, I don't think I would know how to make real numbers, but if we could imagine that such a chart were possible, it might look like this. You have city annihilation all throughout history, and maybe it's a little bump up where you get to the Genghis Khan, maybe it's slightly more effective with Khan, and you go along and go along, and then bang, you get Hiroshima, and it works, and then, got that microphone, and then it comes right back down, and it doesn't, it isn't effective after that. The U.S. bombs Hanoi during Vietnam, and yet that doesn't win the Vietnamese War. So. This is peculiar. This is an anomaly. This is an outlier. Maybe it's unlikely. Maybe it's an incorrect interpretation. If we look at the number of people killed, this is a graph of all 68 cities that were bombed in the summer of 1945. Um, we imagine, from what we've been told, that the number of people killed at Hiroshima would be this huge, you know, goes off the charts, because that's the way it's always presented to us. In fact, Hiroshima is second in terms of number of people killed. Tokyo is first. Tokyo is a conventional attack on March 9th. If you uh, do a graph of the square miles destroyed in each city, of all 68 cities, we would imagine again that Hiroshima would be quite large. Hiroshima is fourth. If you look, for instance, at the percentage of the cities that are destroyed, um, Hiroshima is 17. Toyama is 99.5% destroyed. So it's clear that the atomic, the nuclear attack on Hiroshima, which is worse than the Nagasaki attack, is clearly within the parameters of the conventional attacks that were going on that summer. And in fact, that's what Anami Korachika says to us. He says after, on, on August 13th, the nuclear bombings are no worse than the fire bombings we've been enduring all summer. So let's look. If we are able to believe in Hiroshima, Hiroshima has to touch off a crisis that gets the Japanese to surrender. It has, they have to hit their heads and say, my God, it's over now. We're going to have to surrender. Let's look at what actually goes on. This is uh, Kuabe Torashiro. He's uh, the... Uh, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army. Um, he writes in his diary on August 8th, so two days after Hiroshima, that when he heard that it was a nuclear bomb that had uh, destroyed the city, it gave him a serious jolt. He says shigeki, which is serious jolt. He doesn't say shogeki, which is 
shot. And then he, but he opines, but we must be tenacious and fight on. So it's a serious problem. It's a concern. He's worried. But it's not the end of the world. Now, the Soviets declare war on uh, the night of August 9th, and, uh, or on the early part of August 9th, and they invade Manchuria. And as soon as they do that, he rushes down to uh, headquarters and draws up orders to declare martial law. And in the following meeting that is army only, he says, maybe we should consider overthrowing the emperor and establishing a military dictatorship. So compare. And this is only one guy, but there's a series, if you look at the contemporaneous evidence, um, I didn't want to do all of this stuff. But on the one hand, a serious jolt. On the other, declaring martial law and suggesting that we overthrow the government. Let's look at the timeline. Imagine that we are the Supreme Council of Japan, the effective ruling body. Actually, we can't be the Supreme Council because there's only six of them. So we'll have to be the cabinet. You guys can be the Supreme. The people at the head of the table can be the Supreme Council. The rest of you, you're just cabinet. I'm sorry. Now, let's look and see what we do. So the bomb gets dropped at 8.15 on the 6th. And word starts to reach Tokyo relatively quickly. There are some reports. There's no definitive word right away, but they get a series of reports. Because of the international dateline and so on, Truman's announcement doesn't reach Tokyo until the 7th. But by the morning of the 7th, they know it's a nuclear attack. Um, and they know that the city has been badly damaged. Togo Shigenori, the foreign minister, goes to Suzuki, the prime minister, and says, let's have a meeting of the Supreme Council. This is a big deal. We need to talk about this. Suzuki checks with the military guys, and they say, mm, I don't know, no. And they don't meet. So the question is, if this is a crisis, what the heck are they up to? JFK was in bed on October 16, 1962, at 8.30, when McGeorge Bundy brought him news that the Soviets were putting missiles in Cuba. By 11.15, they had selected a group of advisors, notified them, brought them to the cabinet, and they were meeting to discuss what they were going to do about the crisis. Two hours and 45 minutes. Truman was in Missouri, vacationing in Independence when the, Koreans inv the North Koreans invade South Korea. Atchison calls him on the Saturday morning. Within 24 hours, he flies halfway across the United States, and by Sunday evening, he's at Blair House meeting with his principal advisors to discuss what he's going to do. George Brinton McClellan, commander of the Army of the Potomac in the American Civil War, of whom Lincoln said sadly, he's got the slows, <laughs> gets word that a sergeant has found a complete copy of Lee's orders wrapped around three cigars that tell him where all of Lee's units are during the invasion of Maryland and how to get to them and how to defeat them. Even McClellan, who is tardy in all cases, only wastes 12 hours before putting the Army of the Potomac in motion. So the question is, what if it's really true that Hiroshima touches off a crisis how do you explain this three days when Japan's leaders do nothing? Now, finally, the Soviets invade in the night of midnight August 8th, early morning of August 9th, word gets to Tokyo, and within six hours, the Supreme Council is meeting to discuss surrender. Word of Nagasaki comes only after they've already begun meeting. So which is the event that touches off the crisis? Um, let's look at the strategic situation, which is also telling. In the summer of 45, the Japanese government believed they had two options. They could get Joseph Stalin to mediate. Remember, the Soviets are neutral. And this is a relatively um, sophisticated notion, because it's in the Soviets' interest to make sure that the Americans don't get too much in any peace. And the Soviets have the status, the stature, to mediate. The hardliners in the government want to fight one last battle that will inflict so many casualties when the Americans invade, they'll inflict so many casualties they'll get better um, terms from the Americans.
they'll be able to coerce. And it's not a bad strategy. If you read the American cable traffic about casualties, they were worried about having all these casualties. Um, so they had two, two options, and those were the only two options. We know from research those are the only two options they're looking at. Now what happens after Hiroshima? Well, you can still ask Stalin to mediate, and in fact, they are still, that's still a live option. They're still thinking about Stalin, talking to each other about Stalin, when will we hear from Stalin, how many days has it been? And it's still possible to fight a battle against the U.S. when they invade. The army is undamaged after Hiroshima. They're still on the beaches. They're still dug in. You still have two strategic options. What happens after the Soviet intervention? You can't ask Stalin to mediate. He's now a belligerent. And the strategic situation, let's just quickly recap. The U.S. is going to invade Kyushu with 14 divisions on November 1st. Uh, the Japanese have been shifting most of their forces down to the south in preparation for that. It's pretty obvious that's where the invasion is going to come. Some of the best units from Manchuria, in fact, from the Bangtan Army, have been brought over. The Soviets invade with 1.5 million men. They have a 5 to 1 superiority in tanks. Many of the units only stop when they run out of gas. They're slicing through the Kwangtung Army. The 16th Army, uh, 100,000 strong, is tasked with taking the southern half of Sakhalin Island. And then once that operation is complete, their job within 10 to 14 days is to invade Hokkaido from the west. This is a problem. The 5th Area Army, the Japanese 5th Area Army, is dug in, it's under strength at two divisions and two brigades, and it's dug in on the east side of the island. So it doesn't take a military genius to see that while it might be possible to fight one decisive battle against one superpower invading from one direction, the chances of being able to do anything useful against two superpowers invading from both directions at once is nil. So, once the Soviets invade, the Japanese are out of options. So my question is, if you want to believe that Hiroshima is why the Japanese surrendered, why is it that you want to argue that they surrendered? Here's the event that was strategically decisive. Why would they surrender over an event that wasn't strategically decisive? And not because of one that was. And the Japanese tell us this themselves. In the Supreme Council in June, they have a full dress discussion about the situation with Russia, and they say the fate of the empire depends on the, the neutrality of the Soviet Union. And Kawabe, who's really kind of a cheerleader, gung ho, goes a little bit farther, and he says the absolute maintenance of peace in our relations with the Soviet Union is the fundamental condition. Interestingly, if you read the full record of the deliberations of the Supreme Council. All throughout 1945, they mention city bombing. They never have a full dress discussion about city bombing. And they mention it, even in passing, only twice. Once in May, just as, a, as an aside, and once on the night they're discussing surrender. So it's difficult on the evidence, not from a theoretical or an argumentative point of view, but on the evidence, it's difficult to make the case that they cared about city bombing. Put yourself in the shoes of Emperor Hirohito. The war's over. You've lost. You've dragged your country into uh, a devastating defeat. The cities are in a shambles. The economy has been damaged. The army has suffered defeats. The navy is confined to port. What do you say? Do you say, we made a lot of mistakes and we didn't think through things really carefully and uh, we could have been braver, but we just weren't? Or do you say, the enemy made an amazing scientific breakthrough that no one could have predicted, and that's why we lost? Now, Kido Koichi, he's probably the smartest man in the government, he says exactly this. If military leaders could convince themselves that they were defeated by the power of science, but not by lack of spiritual power or strategic errors, they could save face to some extent. And Sakamizu, who's the um, 
Secretary of the Cabinet, says the same thing, but even more explicitly. He says, in ending the war, the idea was to put the responsibility for defeat on the atomic bomb alone and not on the military. This was a clever pretext. It seems clear to me, and I'd be happy to discuss with you, that the Japanese did not surrender because of the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So if this is true, what impact does this have on nuclear deterrence? Nuclear deterrence relies on the threat of city destruction. There are lots of ways to use nuclear weapons. You can use them against military. But fundamentally, every escalation scenario ends with the war getting out of control and cities being at risk. And that that is the, the, the final risk that gives nuclear deterrence its uh, punch. The question is, if city destruction is an ineffective way to wage war, doesn't that call into question the efficacy of deterrence? Doesn't that make us doubt everything that we've thought about deterrence, which after all is only based on one real use in war? Last, let's talk about size. There's a funny thing about the warheads of the U.S. arsenal, at least, and I think the Soviet arsenal as well. They've gotten smaller over time. And that's perfectly reasonable. You want to merv them, you want more, more on a warhead, you want to cut down on the cost of the missiles and so on. But, but there's a little bit of a conceptual problem there because it seems to me that the reason that we care about nuclear weapons, the reason we think that they matter, is because they're big. Their bigness is their key. I mean, if nuclear weapons were no bigger than my finger, we wouldn't care, would we? So how can it be that if bigness is what gives them importance, that over time they've been getting smaller? How can that be? I think one of the things that happens is that we imagine that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between explosion size and utility. That for every step up in the size of the explosion, there is a concomitant step up in the utility, the usefulness of that explosion. But it seems to me that it's more likely that uh, the relationship is more like this. Initially, bigger explosions are better, they get more done. But at some point, it begins to tail off, you get less benefit. And then eventually, larger and larger explosions are actually less useful. Think about the bank guard. Uh, we're all the bank trustees, we're having a meeting, we're hiring a bank guard, there's been some bank robberies. And we want to protect the money, which is important. We want to give our bank guard the most powerful weapon possible to protect the money. So we give him dynamite. It's a very powerful weapon. So here we are. There's a bad guy with a note and a gun standing in front of Julie, the teller in the center cage. He wants the money. So what's the bank guard going to do? He's going to throw a stick of dynamite and blow the guy up and blow up Julie and blow up the customers and destroy the, the, the bank lobby? It seems to me that it is possible that there are tools and weapons, because weapons are a subset of tools, that are just too big. This is the Spruce Goose built by Howard Hughes. It's the largest, supposedly the largest plane ever built. It flew once. Um, this is another example where bigness was not necessarily related, related to effectiveness. This is a biblical story that you may be familiar with. Don't bet on the big guy, that's my advice. Hey, here's another example, for instance, of technology that is certainly big, but if you've ever tried to park, for instance, or uh, more recently, this is my favorite. This is often called Big Bertha in the US. It's actually, um, Big Bertha was a mortar. Uh, this is the uh, Paris gun. The barrel was 100 feet long. It's World War I. Uh, the German shell, it could lob a shell 80 miles, the German shell Paris from March to August of 1918. They killed 300 and 270 people, 600 casualties. Um, and uh, it was so heavy it had to be moved on a railway car. But what's funny about super guns, there were a couple others that were built in World War II. But what's funny is that African nations don't 
trade their diamond and oil wealth for super guns. And there are no diatribes in liberal papers saying we've got to ban super guns. And you might say to me, but of course we are. I mean, of course there aren't. Because it wasn't effective. And it seems to me that that's exactly right. That it is a weapon's effectiveness that matters, not its size. So, the new paradigm that I want to try and introduce is uh, this uh, is something that you are all going to have to help build. This is not the right name for it, but it's the best I could do. So I want you all to think about how, how do you best capture this notion of effectiveness versus bigness. The outsized tool problem. It's not about a biblical vision of the world. It's not about horror. It's about tools. How many people own a sledgehammer? Anybody? Okay. When's the last time it came out of the tool shed? Three years ago. What? Three years ago. Three years ago. The problem with sledgehammers, it's a powerful tool, but it's unwieldy, and it's not really useful for very much. You can't dig a trench with it, or prune a tree, or fix a watch. You can do dentistry with a sledgehammer, but if you have a tooth extractor, why would you want to? The thing about the outsized tool paradigm is it brings utility questions to the fore. And people object to this because they want to say, well, the only way to argue against nuclear weapons is the moral way of is, is, is morality questions. But I think it's possible to make a case that is in part about morality. It is wrong to bomb civilians. But it's also in part about utility. Destroying cities doesn't win wars. And if the tool that you have is really good at one thing and that doesn't win wars, then um, nuclear weapons really are only ideally suited for destroying cities. Destroying cities doesn't win wars. Nuclear weapons are dangerous, there's no question. They can kill a lot of people, there's no question. But are they useful? That's the question. The apocalypse paradigm puts the world on its ear. Enormous, it has certain power, it brings morality questions to the fore. We've spent 60 years trying to persuade people to abandon nuclear weapons just with morality arguments. Uh, front and center, and, uh, and that hasn't been successful. It promotes a kind of a gloomy, apocalyptic view of the world. Um, the outsized tool paradigm shows that Hiroshima is not an exception. It actually fits right in with the whole history of city destruction. It didn't work. It was horrible. It killed a lot of people, but it didn't affect the outcome. And then the ineffectiveness, the anomalies that we saw earlier now suddenly begin to make sense because it shouldn't surprise us that nuclear weapons couldn't prevent the Berlin crisis and didn't win the war in Vietnam because they're not that useful. On the other hand, the opposite end of the spectrum, what we learn from looking at the history of precision guided munitions is that they have been very effective. And this contrast should inform the way we think about nuclear weapons. Over the last 30 years, the U.S. has had extraordinary success from precision weapons. Um, what happens to unuseful weapons? In World War I, chemical weapons were used extensively. What people found is that they don't have much of a strategic impact. They didn't deliver a real advantage to either side. Biological weapons are largely the same. They're difficult to aim precisely. The wind blows and they Blow, the, the stuff blows around. Um, they're really, it's difficult to imagine a situation in which you could win a war by actually employing biological weapons. There's always the danger it spreads back to your own troops or population. Well, of course, chemical weapons were banned, and biological weapons were banned. And it seems to me that their chief characteristics is that they're horrible, they're dangerous, and they can kill a lot of people, but they're not very useful. So the question is, if those criteria are the ones that lead to weapons being banned, dangerous, kill a lot of people, hard to win a war with, why is it that we can't have this be a group that contains three types of weapons?
building the nuclear weapon, building nuclear weapons for the U.S., for the Soviet Union, all the nations that have built them is a remarkable achievement, particularly the U.S. Uh, building in two and a half years this complicated, solving a lot of technological problems is a very, it's, it's remarkable. But destroying cities doesn't win wars, destroying Hiroshima didn't win World War II, bigger isn't always better. And weapons that aren't useful get abandoned or banned. The defense of the United States is vitally important. There are serious doubts about the reliability and usefulness of nuclear weapons. We cannot depend for any part of that defense on weapons that may not be useful. This is all wrong. Bombing civilians in World War II, and I apologize for the, we transferred the presentation from a Mac to a PC. I'm not gonna say anything bad about Microsoft but only because I'm biting my tongue. <laughs> bombing civilians was called terror bombing in World War II. And it, so it shouldn't surprise us that the people for whom nuclear weapons are most likely to be useful are terrorists. It seems to me that the best way to prevent nuclear weapons from falling into the hands of terrorists is to have a worldwide ban on those weapons. The U.S. is one of the most capable conventional military forces in the world. And U.S. security would not be damaged by a worldwide ban on nuclear weapons. Um, since World War II, the largest budget item in the spending that the United States government has done uh, is uh, conventional military spending most money that the U.S. has spent. The second largest is Social Security. Third largest, nuclear weapons. Five <clears throat> point, more than five point five trillion dollars. Thinking about bailouts and economic difficulties that lie ahead, it seems to me that it raises serious questions about nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, too big, dangerous, impractical, and wasteful. Wouldn't we all be safer in a world free of nuclear weapons? Thank you.